It's the Daily Dog. Hey y'all, welcome back to the Daily Dog. Thanks for hanging out with me today. It is a Friday, my friends, and that means it is a masterpiece Friday. And today, y'all, strap in. It's going to be a good one. We are going to be looking at what has been called the best rock performance in history at the best rock gig in history. We're going to be looking at Live Aid from 1985 and the set by Queen. I am excited as shit <laughs> to look at this, y'all. Uh, thanks to GBC and Janine and Seth and all the Queen fans that have been encouraging me to continue to feature this band on the channel and GBC specifically for suggesting this performance from Live Aid and also to Janine for letting me know that there was an extended version of this available on YouTube and that's what we're going to be looking at. So uh, let's get a little bit of information in before we dive in, y'all. Live Aid was a benefit concert that was held in July of 1985. It was organized by Bob Geldof and Midge Ure to help raise awareness and funds to combat the widespread, fa uh, widespread famine that was going on in Ethiopia, in Africa at the time. It was held at Wembley Stadium in London and was attended by about 72,000 people in that one stadium but there were concerts all around the world that were held on that day amassing one of the largest live television audiences in the entirety of human history an estimated 1.9 billion people from around the world watched at the time it was about 40 percent of the world's population i was eight at the time and I was probably out playing with my friends and not really paying attention so I have seen clips of this Queen performance uh, but I've never sat down and watched the entire thing through and as I was reading in like the, the performers that were at this thing is the list is long and distinguished we've got Sting, Phil Collins, Elvis Costello, U2, Dire Straits, David Bowie, The Who, Elton John and Paul McCartney all at just <laughs> the one in London and there were uh, different acts all around the world uh, but the band that uh, now almost 37 years later that is still regarded as the band that stole that show is Queen uh, their set lasted 21 minutes the band hesitated as I read in saying yes to participate in this but they did accept the invitation they ended up rehearsing for a week uh, uh, honing their set list and uh, they, uh, like I said, they stole the show. So I'm going to uh, get right to this, y'all. This is a 29-minute video on YouTube that we're just going to hang out and uh, listen to together. So let's get rolling, shall we? This is the extended uh, Live at Live Aid from July 13th of 1985 featuring Queen. Here we go. Huh. <laughs> Somebody to love. I don't think they sang this one or performed this one at this particular show, though. So what are we looking at? Pre-game. Classic song, isn't it? The timing of all the bands looks like. I think that's Bob Geldof there. Uh, the guy with the kid around his leg. Look at all of the people. Wow. Never been to uh, the UK. I would love to come there sometime. There it is back in the day. Elton. Cool. Okay. So there's uh, Princess Diana and Charles. It looks like Bob's with them there. Great song. So this is, it looks like Brian and Roger uh, behind them, right? So this must have been earlier in the day. God, 
all of those people. I wouldn't know what to do myself with myself. Okay. Hello. Over here in England, can I just have a bit of help and attention the There's the four guys. We got Freddie on lead vocals, piano, and guitar. Uh, Brian May is on guitar and vocals. John Deacon on the bass. Roger Taylor on drums and vocals. The classic lineup. Right? I think Somebody to Love was from A Day at the Races, as I remember. I think that was back in 75 or 76 that that album came out. Huge stage. Yeah, they're sound checking, right? So that's part of the fun and the scariness of doing gigs like this, is that you don't get a chance to do your own sound check and dial everything in and get a feel for the stage. You're coming right on after somebody else and spotlight's on. Ladies and gentlemen, can we have a very warm Wembley welcome, please, for Mel Smith and Griff Reese jones those aren't the people I was expecting them to introduce. Help me out, guys. Who are these guys? They, they dressed up as police people. They might be police people, but I doubt it. One, two. One, two. Mic check. All right, they're helping them out. This is our spare lead vocal line. Spare lead vocal line. So they're trying to get sound check for Queen during this. <laughs> We've heard complaints about the noise. That's funny. From a woman in Belgium. <laughs> so I mean, you just keep it That's how loud they are. Uh, People in Belgium are complaining the about the noise. We're enjoying the boogie woogie music here today. <laughs> Boogie well, boogie. I would ask you to bear in mind that there are a lot of people, perhaps older people in the area, who perhaps aren't up to date with the latest trends in modern music. Just looking at all of the scurry of activity that's going on behind them, and the crowd is smelling something. They know. Maybe they're starting to see some of the band get on stage. They are ready to go. Anyway, uh, it gives us enormous pleasure to introduce the next combo, who are, uh... Queen. Her Majesty! Her Majesty! Queen! Queen, that's cool. Alright, let's go, y'all. As I read in, they came on around 6.45 p.m. local time. And it's in the height of July, so the sun's not going to go down for a few hours later. But it's getting close to prime time, and, and everybody can be around their television sets and, uh, and tune in live and see it. So Freddie's over at the piano. Sound checking. There he goes. And right into it. It's amazing how close the camera is to him. And how intimate this is. A live performance designed for reaching millions of people, so they've got the cameras right on stage. Old school Pepsi. <laughs> and a beer or two. The first time, y'all, that I really remember paying attention to this song is like many people who are of my generation. Uh, thanks to Wayne's World, <laughs> the movie with Mike Myers and Dana Carvey. And that great scene with them rocking out to Bohemian Rhapsody in the car. Down to six, G minor. Um, um, e flat. I 
haven't ever really paid attention to how the harmonies in this particular song work. Maybe we should dive into that one at some point. Because I don't think we're going to be playing the entirety of these songs. It's kind of a greatest hits set, I think. Cool. So they land on an A natural, which is a tritone away from where they kind of were in that E flat. That's kind of cool. Okay. I'm with you, Freddy. But if I tried to wear that in public, I might get a citation. <laughs> I love using the, the microphone itself as a prop, right? Almost like you're playing guitar, but you don't have the guitar, so you've got the, the mic with you. This is Radio Gaga. At the time, I think it was from their most recent album called The Works, which was released in 1984. I think that's F, but they're in. Seven minutes to five. There it is. Look at them. Everybody, it's just the the crowd participation in Queen's songs is I think the intangible that makes them one of the his, one of history's best live acts, right? No matter who you are in that stadium. Get it, Freddy. He's gonna reach you. The band's gonna reach you no matter where you are because you're performing with the band, right? People around the world doing the same thing. Music changes through the years. This was a commentary on the uh, gaining popularity and influence of music videos and music television, as opposed to just the sounds of the music themselves and the visuals becoming just as important as the sounds themselves. People around the world doing that with them. Huh. Radio, someone still loves you. Born performer, right? Freddy is. Okay. Still can't believe all those people. I've seen this. You gonna sing with me?
I'm sure this was improvised. But man, what a way to get the crowd in the palm of your hand if they haven't already. They're right with me. He's performing right to the camera. <laughs> I haven't been able to wear pants that size since I was about seven, I think which would have been about the same time that they were recording this. Freddy stole my pants. <laughs> so this song is called Hammer to Fall. And it, I think, also was from the Works album from 1984. I think the first time I really remember hearing this one was uh, in the Highlander movie. Great movie, right? All that clean music in it. an A for this one, good guitar key. The, the sound that they have and the cohesion and power that they have is testament to how hard they practiced and rehearsed for this and how much effort and uh, intention they put into their live performances. These are pros, and it shows, right? I love that Freddie just gets to kind of like air guitar with his um, mic stand there um, to interact with Ryan as he's playing a solo. It's kind of fun. What the hell are we fighting for, y'all? This has references at the time to the ongoing uh, Cold War. Um, the hammer could refer to the Soviet hammer and sickle, right? Um, but I think I read that Freddie said it was kind of about the cycle of life, the inevitability of death, and how that's just part of the cycle of life. The hammer's gonna fall, y'all. Live life to the fullest. thing to go back and watch some of this classic concert footage very recently before we had the cell phones ubiquitous you know in every person's hand so all you see is everybody's arms and hands not cell phones in the air get it ready all right I'm having so much fun. I hope y'all are as well. This is awesome. I haven't been to a live show in a couple years. And I get to go to a couple uh, more shows soon. And I'm so excited to get back out and have these, you know great experiences with a whole bunch of people listening to live music. Can't wait. That sounds like crazy little thing called Love Backboard. There's actually only dedicated to beautiful people here tonight. It means all of you. Thank you for coming along and making this a great occasion. 
Yep. Kind of a rockabilly in D. But seven to four to one. Showing such range in this set. Everything sounds like Queen, but all of these songs are, have a slightly different feel to them. You know, from Bohemian Rhapsody to Crazy Little Thing Called Love. I mean, come on. I hear this song, I think of Freddie kind of emulating Elvis as a, as a, um, you know, an inspiration or an influence because it gives me a sense that, you know, you, you, it's, it's an Elvis style song, right? The, uh, the song was first included on their album called The Game, which was released in 1979. outside of New York City um, nine or ten years ago and the stadium was full and it was one of those tent pole experiences that I'll never forget alright growing up in the 80s looking up to the kids that are older than you and you go to the high school and these this song would play at the pep rallies every time minor and then it goes to a riff on an A chord. So going to the four. That's one that even I could drum, y'all. But it works. And it's short. Boy they just played a little bit of it. <laughs> 
and then we are the champions. I think this is what concludes the set. It's really great symmetry to start on the piano to end on the piano. Gives um, a sonic um, sort of great bow to wrap this all up together. And they've been in three different keys, <laughs> just on this song. They started in C. Woo. Hang in there, Freddy. They started in C, and then went to E flat, and then went to F. So they get back to C. You brought me fame and fortune and everything that goes with it. I thank you all. But it's been a bed of roses. It goes right to E flat. No pleasure clues. I consider it a challenge. It goes to B flat as the dominant, but it goes up to C as a new dominant and then down to F. Just makes it just up the up the intensity. I think we could look back if we were able to look forward into the future 100 years, 150 years, 200 years, the same way that we still hear music by Bach and Mozart today, people will still be listening to Queen. It's timeless, absolutely timeless music. Anything that can get almost 2 billion people to clap along, you know, in real time, some powerful stuff. And you know that he's given it everything that he has. All four of them are. Hmm. An absolute gift to the world, their artistry. Yeah. I think one of the most unique, uniquely talented, and charismatic uh, performers in the history of music, Freddie Mercury, which makes this band unique and um, unrivaled because of, uh, mainly because of Freddie's presence. And the music is just awesome. That's cool. That's really fun. Hmm. Man, that was fun. I hope y'all had some fun. I need to talk about that last little song um, a little bit here. Is this the world we created? Um, uh, is uh, I think Freddie uh, and Brian uh, wrote this. Uh, Freddie wrote the lyrics and Brian wrote the music. And it was written, uh, I think, when they were in Munich. And they were watching some news of the poverty and the ongoing crisis uh, in Africa at that time. And, and this song uh, came from that. Uh, the ending of this, is this the world we created? We made it on our own. Is this the world we devastated right to the bone? If there's a God in the sky looking down, what can he think of what we've done to the world that he created? Right? I think it's still uh, a song that uh, has uh, resonance. Um, today. The world that we've created is imperfect and messy and uh, full of injustice and uh, my hope is that we're continually trying to make it better uh, for as many people as possible 
instead of trying to uh, take from it what we think is ours and um, separate ourselves from the other people. If there's anything that I learn or take from uh, an event like this, it's the importance of these big shared human experiences. It what It's what binds us together. You know, reality is all from our own points of view. It's how we see the world, right? Reality is uh, based on <laughs> our perceptions and points of view. And when we all get, to, when we're separated, right, those points of views can be, um, can become uh, like shards and shoot off and be separated from a lot of other society without people really understanding and knowing. And it's how I think people can get radicalized and become sort of isolated from the rest of society. But these big tentpole shared experiences like concerts, you know, 72,000 people in, you know, Wembley Stadium at the time and almost 2 billion people tuning in around the world uh experiencing this bit of of music and uh and we have that in common now and we can compare how we reacted to it and what we think about it and that helps create this bond uh that wouldn't exist otherwise uh i read a quote by uh, bob geldof who was the organizer and promoter of this uh talking about queen and he said this queen understood the idea exactly that this was a global jukebox they just went and smashed one hit after another it was the perfect stage for freddy the whole world right and i don't know i i think the people on mars were paying attention to this too i think freddy could reach interstellar status if if we somehow uh have the technology to do that at some point but y'all this has been such a fun Masterpiece Friday. I hope that you enjoyed it. Thanks, GBC, for suggesting this one. And again, Janine, Seth, all of the Queen fans that that keep this band and your, uh, your excitement for this band uh, and how you share it with me uh, makes me want to keep listening to more Queen uh, on this channel especially. And I'm so happy that we did today. It's been a wonderful week, everybody. We've got more uh, episodes coming at you in the coming days and weeks, but that's all for today. Thanks for hanging out with me. We'll see you next time on another edition of The Daily Doug.